your following message from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two worship services on Sunday, 9 a.m. worship traditional, which is called Traditions, and then a more modern worship at 1111 a.m., which you like to call Bridge. Join us anytime. We're a growing church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. One of the things that God wants from you and I, if we are Christians, if we are believers, one of the things that God wants more than anything else from you and I is God wants to talk to you. God wants you to talk to him. We call that prayer. We call it prayer. In the series that we are in, in the letter to the Ephesians, our title is In Christ, Saved and Secure. Now, saved and secure always touches a nerve in some of us because we are not certain, or some are not certain. Some believe that you can be saved, but if you mess up, You can be lost. And uh, while that is not the topic of today's message, the reason I titled it Saved and Secure or In Christ Saved and Secure is because I want you to know that if what God says in his word is true, and I believe that it is, then it clearly indicates that if anybody puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved and you shall be secure. Today's title is How to Pray for one another. Now, prayer is a subject that we've been on in this church for quite a while now. In fact, for the last three or four years, we've just kind of uh, been on this journey of praying and prayer. And um, for me, it started uh, January of uh, 2019. Uh, Not that that that's when I started praying. I didn't mean (laughs) But in January of 2019, I felt the Lord really leading us to pray as a church together. Now, we had our Wednesday night service, just like we always do, and we prayed there, pray for a lot of things. But I really felt God leading us to, go, to pray and pray together as a church and pray often and pray maybe even sometimes long. And so we started a men's group in our prayer room that we now have over here across the way in, the, in one of our facilities. And uh, about myself and four or five other guys started praying together. And we began to pray every Wednesday Uh, about uh, nine o'clock we had a ladies group that was meeting uh, on Sunday afternoons I think about four o'clock or something like that and they'd been meeting uh, way before we ever started and uh, little did I know that in January of 2020 we would go into one of the most difficult times of our uh, our nation's history and probably the world in many respects and even to this day we're probably still feeling the effects of all of that but when we came out of that as quickly as we could, we began to pray again. And uh, I contacted several of our members of our church, and I said, if you would like to be part of a prayer ministry, I would like to invite you to be part of that. And, uh, and uh, we did, and we prayed together, and we had our first meeting one time, and then we just kind of uh, did not do anything. But a while back, we decided that we needed to get back to that in a more consistent way. And so we started just a few I don't remember exactly when we started it, but we started calling it prayer and praise uh, on Sunday nights every quarter. And some some of our folks said, Pastor, we need to do that all the time, and we may get there. We probably will. But I believe that prayer is important. I believe that it's uh, one of the most important, if not the most important thing that a church can do. I want to remind you that the church started praying in prayer. 120 people, shortly after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, came to an upper room, and they were hanging out there together, and they were praying, and they were visiting with each other, and I don't know how long they were in there, and I don't know how long they were there. Uh, I think the Bible kind of tells us that, but, um, and then something supernatural happened that God, that the Lord Jesus had promised them, said that he would, and that is the coming of the Holy Spirit, and you know the story. They begin to 
They began to preach and they began to win people for Christ and thousands got saved and baptized and all of that stuff. That by the time we get to the chapter 12 or 5 of the book of Acts, there's something like, I don't know, 20,000 or so that are part of the new church and believers. But something that the church did all throughout the book of Acts that you see it, especially in the very early beginnings for the first seven, eight, nine chapters or so, the church met continuously to pray, to pray. So much so was praying important that the apostles felt that it was important for them to remain uh, in what some called the prayer and, and uh, their sharing of the gospel that they chose to have the church pick seven men that we now call deacons uh, to handle a need that, w that arose in the church. The disciples felt like it was so important for them to be praying together and then sharing the gospel that they assigned that obviously important ministry and responsibility to those seven guys. And the church went on praying. Um, and then we see the conversion of Paul and we see the change there, just church constantly praying. I hear from meetings I go to and people that I talk to that there are pockets of revival happening among our nation uh, and all of them, all of them that can be confirmed as like really God moving is due to people get, come together and pray. And they're praying for each other and they're praying for the lost and they're praying for a whole host of other things. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever prayed for someone or attempted to pray for someone but not know what to pray for? Just not, I, I just don't know what to say, Lord. You come to the Lord, you, you sit in your chair or you get on your knees, wherever it is that you spend time praying with the Lord, and you come to that place and you say, Lord, I, I don't know what to ask you for. What, what do I pray? I've been there. Many of you have been there. Sometimes it is hard to pray for people uh, for lots of reasons. This morning, I want to talk to us about a passage of scripture that is not that way. And Paul is rejoicing, and he tells us in this passage in Ephesians, just like he does in the letter to the Philippians, why he's praying for the Ephesian Christians. So I want to invite you to go there with me to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 15 through 19. As we continue through the letter, um, <clears throat> we're about done with chapter 1. And uh, last Sunday was a packed message of a whole host of words um, that we're going to try to unravel throughout the letter as we, as we make our way through there. So I, if you'll stand with me, let's read this passage of scripture and then we'll get into God's word. This is what Paul wrote. This is why... Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the mighty working of his strength. And Father, thank you for this passage. Now, Lord, I pray that as we go through it, you speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's someone here praying for someone else, Perhaps today would change the way they pray. Perhaps today they would have an answer on how to pray or what to pray. Lord, I pray that if any of us in here this morning have stopped praying, been discouraged to pray, that somehow, Lord, we would be convicted in our hearts to pick up the prayer mantle again and start praying, knowing that you will give us the words to say and the Holy Spirit will guide us in what we need to do and say. Even to the point, Lord, of you will draw to our attention and to our mind those whom we need to pray for, no matter who they are. Lord, may we be like Paul, 
that we would rejoice in praying for other people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So last week, we unpacked all of these big words uh, as Paul gives an explanation of the blessings, the spiritual blessings from above that we have in Christ Jesus. We're not going to rehash all of that today, um, but there are some big, as we said last week, some big theological words. We, call, we use theological because that's, that's what we know them to be. You know, those words um, uh, imply some kind of a teaching or doctrine, if you will, and some of those are controversial. Um, we, we run into that all, all the time, uh, and we're not going to talk about those, but I do invite you to come on Wednesday, as James said. We're going to unpack some of those words, um, like the, the passage that talks about uh, you are chosen, or predestination, the word redemption, and uh, all of those words have big, huge implications about our identity in Christ Jesus, how we came to know Christ and why that's important. We won't do that today, but that's basically Paul saying all of these spiritual blessings that are found in verse 3 through 14 are what we received when we came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, so those are your blessings, spiritual blessings. Okay, all those words that we talked about. And then we talked about words such as in Christ or because of the Father, in some form or another. All of these things, these words, apply to us in Christ Jesus, okay? Or because of Christ Jesus. And the motive for it all was the Father, the will of the Father, the desire of the Father, the love of the Father, the grace of the Father, the mercy of the Father. All of these words all are spiritual blessings to us in Christ Jesus. And so Paul has kind of explained that, and that's what we have in him. But then Paul comes in these next verses and he begins to tell them of the joy that he has in, in these believers for the, the faith that they, that they have and the fact that they love all of the other saints. By the way, the word saint there is another word that we find in this passage of scripture that describes who we are in Christ Jesus. And so Paul in verse 15 says to these Christians, he says, this is why. In other words, because of all that I've repeated in these previous verses, this is why I, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. And so how do we pray for one another? Well, there's many ways that we pray for each other. Uh, as Christians, we pray for each other. We pray that God would provide uh, things that we need, pray for our financial needs, our, our health needs, and all of that. If you look at our prayer sheet, on Wednesday, we have a lot of people there that have all kinds of needs. We pray for those. Some are salvation needs, some are uh, restoration needs, some are uh, medical needs, and all of that stuff. We pray for each other uh, right here in this room. And uh, we spend uh, quite a bit of time trying to, trying to remember all of those people on our list and pray for them in some form or another. There's no way that one person, myself, could utter uh, a prayer for every one of those people and, um, and still remain standing, I guess. But that's why we break up in groups and we pray for each other. Besides that, that's what the church is supposed to do. Pray for one another and with each other. So we do that. We can pray for people's salvation. We can pray for people's direction, that God would direct them, give them a, a place to go. But I want to give you something different today. Not that it's new, but it's different in, in, in what Paul and Paul's prayer here uh, for Christians. Something that you can pray for. For other people. Uh, and so you might have a list of Christians that you pray for. Um, this would be a good time to pray for them this particular prayer. And then maybe you have some lost friends, people that don't know Christ or are looking for the Lord or trying to follow Jesus or whatever, but they just have not made it there. And you want to pray for them. This would be a good prayer to pray for them. So I hope this helps you and I when it comes to our prayer. And the first word that I want to give you, if you're taking the notes on the app or you're taking the little printout that we have right over there on the table and you want to use that and you want to jot the, these words down, you can. Let me give you first the attitude of Paul's prayer. I want to talk to you about the attitude of Paul's prayer because look, attitude in prayer is huge. All right? For example, if I approach prayer not believing that God is going to answer me, 
then your chances of, of, uh, of really delivering a, 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 a prayer to the Lord that you want God to answer you could be hindered. It's not, that, it's not that God can't. But if you don't believe that God had, you don't have faith that God can do that, you're not going to ask him very often. You're not going to ask him at all. You and I have to believe that God does answer prayer. You have to believe that by faith. Uh, and so um, the, the attitude in prayer, Paul uses a word here that I think is very important when we pray. So I would encourage all of us this morning that when you pray, approach prayer with thanksgiving. Approach prayer with thanksgiving. Have an attitude of thanksgiving. Be thankful. You'll hear me pray and you'll hear others in our church pray. And many of them will start their prayer by just simply taking a moment to thank God for lots of things. There's lots of things that we can be grateful for. Um, you and I have many, many reasons to be thankful to God for. I won't enumerate all of them, but there, you, you have some. I know you do. The, the reasons why you should be thankful. And so Paul was always, in all of his prayers, if you look at all of his prayers in every one of his letters where he's praying for people, he has an attitude of gratitude. He's thankful for those believers. He's thankful for their faith. He's thankful that they have love for each other. He's, it just, he just goes on and on. Um, that's important. Let me give you another reason. Not only should you be thankful, uh, but here's another uh, uh, approach that you can have in prayer. And that is, you and I need to have the motivation or the desire to remember. Um, and, and why is that important? Because sometimes what we do is we'll pray for somebody today, and then we'll go six weeks and, oh yeah, I forgot I was praying for so-and-so, and you don't, and you don't pray for them. Look, let me urge you to remember to pray for people. Remember, and there's many ways you, you can do that. You can have a notebook. You can do all those kinds of things. That'll, that'll be up to you. But remember to pray for people. And as, as I said to the first worship service, I said to them, you, you have heard me say often many times that if we're in church and we're all gathered here, we're fixing to have church and we're starting, we're talking, we're laughing, we're doing all those things right before worship service that we all do, greeting one another and, and all that. Every now and then somebody will come up to you, to me, or any one of us at one time or another, and we start talking about what's going on, and then all of a sudden you'll hear this. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? And inevitably, what, what do we do? We say, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you. And we get in the worship service, we sing, we do all of that kind of stuff, read scripture, go to Bible study, we go home, and we forget to pray for that person, don't we? We just do. We're all... We're all we, it, all, it happens to all of us. And you've heard me say many times, if somebody walks up to you during church or right about the time we're getting ready to start church or do something like that, and they say, would you please pray for me? You've heard me say this many times, and I'll continue to say it. Stop right there and pray for them. Amen. You don't know, and I believe, that God may have sent that person to you right there and then because they need prayer right there and then. Spiritual matters are important. And, um, and so I would urge you to pray. Listen, nobody in this church, if they see you, you praying with somebody um, right there in front of everybody else, then no one in this church is going to say something to you like, man, that, isn't that weird? Or call you ridiculous or anything like that. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to do when we fellowship. When you get done with your prayer, just fall in line with the rest of us and start singing, doing whatever. But pray for people and remember to pray for. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Break away from the habit of saying, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll remember. Now, I understand. I get it, folks. Sometimes we're, we are in a hurry. We're passing ships and we're headed somewhere and we say that. But, but don't forget to pray. Have an attitude of thanksgiving and have an attitude of remembering to pray and take advantage of the opportunity to pray for somebody right there. So there's the attitude of prayer. But then I want to talk to you this morning about the, the altitude, the altitude of Paul's prayer. What was it? How deep? How profound? How wide? How high? What was the, the scope of Paul's prayer? What was, what was all-encompassing in, in, in Paul's prayer? Two things he mentions in this, in this uh, passage of Scripture that I want you to remember as you pray for other people. Listen to what he says in verse 17. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's number one. 
If you want people to grow in the Lord, if you want people to grow as Christians, mature in Christ, if you want people to understand and comprehend these big words that we just looked at last week that are sometimes confusing to some and, and so forth, if you want them to understand those words and to get a grasp on what they mean, pray for them and ask God to give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that they can get there. Our challenge is that, listen, folks, I know there, there are some doctrines in the scripture that it took me a long while to understand and to be able to comprehend. Even to this day, sometimes there are things that I'm like, man, I, I hope I clarify that. I, I hope I have it straight in my own head. You ever thought about that? You know, it's like, man, I hope I got it right in my own head, right? But we can pray that God, by the power of his, of his spirit, give you and I the kind of wisdom that comes from above and the revelation so that we can know God in a special way. I don't know how many times as a pastor I run into people who tell me this all the time. So they'll say something like that. Man, pastor, I just, I really wish I could do something to get to know God better. You know what? So do I. So do I. And I can give you a number of things that you can do. Pray, read the scriptures, all of that. We know all of those things. But I would urge you to pray. Pray that, that God would do that for people. And then there's another one. Listen to what he says. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Now that's a mouthful. Okay, but look. Many of you don't know this, but um, I, most of my life I've, I've had eyesight problems, even to this day. And uh, several years ago, I got really tired of having to put on contact lenses. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you hate those things, but they can be a pain. I have a disease called keratoconus, which is a deterioration of uh, the cornea. And it's, it's terrible if you're wearing... Uh, soft contact lenses because that cornea, it, it just shapes like a, it's, instead of being like really round like it's supposed to be, it kind of shapes like a cone and it's just deteriorating and getting worse. And so a soft contact lens shapes to that so it does you no good. You know, the contact lens is designed to, 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 to give you a, 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 a direction so that you can cl see clearly. But if the, if the soft contact lens shapes to your deteriorating eye, well, it's like having nothing. And, and so, um, so I, I struggled with that until one day I found a doctor uh, in Midland, Texas, who uh, does um, implants in your eyes. I forget the name of what they call them, uh, but they're like little half-shaped moons that they insert, yes, insert in your eye uh, by surgical means. And they insert them in there, uh, in your cornea, one above and one on the bottom. And they've got little moons. And what they do is they reshape the cornea in such a way that it gives it back its roundedness so that when you look, you, the, what you see is clearer and sharper. Well, that didn't fix me totally and completely, right? But when he did that, um, I was able to see a whole lot better without contact lenses and without... Uh, anything at all. Now, I still wear them. I still have contact lenses, but now they're hard contacts because I can't wear the soft ones. But before I had that surgical implant, I was, I was, I could not see at all. I mean, I just, I'm just telling you, I just, I mean, I, and, and I was, I wasn't blind, but, but, and, and, but I, but I almost was. I couldn't see. And it was awful. And when they did that, I was able to see better. And with contact lenses, they can make me see 2020. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? So I can literally see all of you right now. So if you smirk, I can tell. <laughs> you know, some of us, like me physically, have that in our spiritual walk and journey. You, you, you can't comprehend yet certain things. You're still struggling with that. Okay, you can't explain for some of you. It may be just something like, you know, pastor, I really would like to share the gospel with people, but I'm I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up because I myself am still learning. I, I understand that. 
And then there's other things, other doctrines, other teachings that I wish I understood, that I wish I comprehended, but I don't. Church, can I urge you to do something? Would you pray for people that God would open their spiritual eyes so they can see, so they can understand, so they can understand what God is trying to tell them? For example, I tell people this all the time. Often people say, Pastor, I just, I just wish I knew God better. Here's what I tell them. I tell them this. You want, you want to know the quickest way to get to know God better? Here it is. You heard me say this the last time. Obey him. Obey him. And watch what happens. God calls you to do something, to go somewhere, to help someone. And you're like, I don't have time to do that. I don't want to do that. Or whatever that means, right? Whatever it is. If you will just obey him, you'll be amazed at what God wants you to learn through that experience. First thing that happens is that you get to know him in that way, helping that person do that thing, whatever it is God is calling you to do. God permits things to come to our lives, and you say, oh, God, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to experience that. Who wants to experience that? That's awful. And God says, yeah, but I want you to get to know me better, and I want you to walk through that. Some of you know God in ways that you would say, oh, I wish if there was any way that I, that I could know God without that, I would do it. Yeah, me too. But sometimes some of those things are not avoidable. It's life. It happens. So Paul says, now that I've explained who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and how much you have in Christ, and how secure all of that is in Christ, now I'm going to pray to the Heavenly Father so that you can understand that and comprehend that. And church, may I ask, may I ask all of us, look, let me, let me stop right here. I did it different in the other service, but I'm going to stop right here because I think it's a good time. Do you know where Paul was when he was praying this prayer? Some of you might not know that. Some of you probably do. He was in prison. He wrote the letter to the Ephesians, the Philippians, I believe the Colossians, and the letters to Timothy. At least the first one. He was in prison. He was hindered. He was chained. He couldn't go as far as he wanted to. He couldn't go to places that he was needing to go. But you know what God did? God brought people to him. And God brought to him the people that loved him and brought him the things that he needed. And then they brought him word of these Christians and how they were doing. And it lifted Paul up and it encouraged him there in prison. And then he writes these powerful letters to these Christians. And then he does something that no one can hinder. No one can stop. Paul prays for these Christians. Paul says, man, I, I tell you what, I may be in this jail cell, but they can't stop me from praying. Let me ask you a question. What hinders you? What box are you in right now? What limitations do you have right now? And I want to tell you, none of those can keep you from praying. About the only thing that keeps you from praying is if you're not thinking, you ain't praying. Sorry for the poor language, but you just can't, right? But listen, you might be sick in bed. Maybe not even able to speak. But if you're thinking, you can pray. You can speak to God. And when you feel like you can't, do it. And extend your prayer for people like Paul did for these Christians. There are people around your life right now. God is the only one who can open their spiritual eyes so they can see. Only God can do that. 
And only you can pray for that. And so we have the attitude of Paul's prayer. We have the altitude, the scope, the whole bigness of his prayer is, man, I want them to understand all this stuff. But then what, is, what does this prayer accomplish? What, what does that prayer accomplish? How many of you have ever said, man, you know, I don't, I don't pray as much because sometimes, I, I, to be honest with you, I just don't feel like my prayer is accomplishing anything. I was feeling that way just a few weeks ago. I was just like, I'm praying for things and Lord, I don't see them happening. This morning when I came, as always happens, um, when, I, when, when I come up to the, the campus and start walking up, I have no earthly idea why church members and Please don't take this the wrong way. I love you guys, but it's the truth. Why some church members think that I can solve church problems in 30 seconds before we get into the worship service. Can I tell you all something? I can't. In fact, it's not even on my mind. It's not that I don't care. It's just I can't fix that right now because I'm getting ready to preach. I'm getting ready to pray. I'm getting ready to sing like all the rest of you. And so there are things that I can't solve. And so inevitably that happens to us when we come up. <clears throat> That's why you might see pastors sometimes, they like, when you see them coming, they're kind of like cringing. They start cringing like this because they're like, who's going to ask me that? And that happened today, but I, you know, I don't get mad about it. I just, but I walked in and right over here in this corner, a couple of guys stopped me and said, pastor, um, we're going to pray before the worship service. And I literally just stopped in my tracks because not only me, but others have been praying about, why don't we have people praying before our worship services? Just praying before the worship service. And I said, what? Yeah, yeah, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for our worship service and we're, we're going to do it right now. Right now? Yeah, right now. And we were praying right over there, and they prayed. And they said, Pastor, we're going to do this every Sunday. And I liked it. my jaw just liked to drop. Because you know what? We've been praying for that, that people would just pray, show up early and say, hey, we don't have anything else to do. We're going to, we're going to pray. What a powerful thing to pray for the worship team, for pray for me, pray for each other right before the service start. That's powerful. What does prayer accomplish? What does Paul's prayer accomplish? Look at the accomplishment of Paul's prayer. Listen to what he says. In verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Now let me jump into verse 20 right quick. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and setting him at his right hand, and he goes on and on. Let me tell you what the accomplishment of Paul's prayer is. This is it. You ought to jot this down. The accomplishment of Paul's prayer is that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and sat him at the right hand of the Father is the same power you experience every day in your life as a believer. Think about that. You mean to tell me that God wants me to experience the power of his resurrection? Didn't Paul say that somewhere else in one of his letters? I want you to experience the power of his resurrection. I want you to experience what it means when when. When Jesus rose, it was the power of God that rose him out of the grave. That same power is what he wants you and me as believers to have, what he wants his church to experience every day, every year. For what purpose? For his glory and to draw other people unto himself. By the way, I want to ask you this question. What other power would you want to experience? 
There is none. When God poured out his grace and his love upon humanity, and you in particular, he poured out everything that he could ever pour out. I heard a preacher this morning say it this way. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing good, uh, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. When God poured out his grace toward humanity, he poured it out in the manifestation of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is none greater than Jesus. I'm going to put it another way. God cannot do and won't do any better than he's already done in his son, Jesus Christ. When you got him, you got it all. You think about that. So when you give your life to Christ, he gave himself totally and completely for you. Why would we do less? Why would we do less? Either you surrender totally and completely to him or not at all. I hope you can pray that way. I hope you can pray like Paul, and you can. I'm going to ask you to bow your head just right there where you are. This is a really special time. Some of you in here, you've, you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. You've, you know you're saved. If you were to die tonight, you have that certainty, not because of anything wonderful that you've done or anything like that. You know in whom you believed in, and you're good with that. If God called you home today, you have that assurance, no question in your heart. Praise God for that. Some of you in here this morning, you don't have that assurance. You just, you just don't have it. Doesn't mean you're awful or anything like that. Just means that you're not sure today. And I am here to tell you, not by my own power, not by my own strength or what I know, but, I, but I'm here to tell you that if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, you can know that for sure. No questions asked. If you today choose to stop relying on yourself and start trusting him, he'll save you right there where you are. That's the power of God. And so you've never done that in just a moment. I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. Some of you in here this morning, maybe you've kind of walked away or you've grown cold or however you want to describe that. And you need to come back to that place where you know you were before. You need to come to him and say, Lord, here I am. Forgive me for what I've done. And he will. Because there's not a sin that he can't forgive. Maybe some of you are looking for a church. You want to be part of a church. In just a moment, I'm going to give you some instruction on how to do that. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're watching online or you're here in, in our uh, auditorium, then let me lead you in a word of prayer. If you're sincere in your heart and you say, Pastor, I want to get this right, would you do this right now, right there where you are? God in heaven. Say that to him right now. God in heaven. I know that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I repent of it today. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and paid my sin in full. I believe that he was buried, but he rose on the third day. And he ascended into heaven and sits at your right hand. 
And I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth today that he is coming back. If you prayed that, if you really meant that to the Lord, I want to sit here and tell you that Jesus came and he did just that. He's already paid the price in full. But if you believe that with all of your heart, he came and he saved you. And his Holy Spirit now makes permanent residency inside of you as a child of God. He's there, never going anywhere. And I encourage you to make that decision or that private decision that you just made. Make it public. Let people know. We'll show you how. Take that card that you have that you right beside you and just flip it over to the back and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer or I marked the one that best describes who you are. Just hold on to that card and I'll give you instructions in a moment. If you're looking for a church, take that same card and on the back it says, I'm looking for a church or something along those lines. Pastor, I'm looking for a church. I'd like to know what Red Bud is all about. And leave it on the chair, or bring it to us, and we'll, we'll be glad to tell you what Red Bud is all about. We just did that a few weeks ago. If you made the decision to follow Christ already and you've trusted him and now you want to follow him in believer's baptism, if you haven't made that decision, come and we'll pray with you. We'll do that. Father, I come to you now. And Lord, if there's anybody who needs prayer, needs to come to this front of this stage and make their decision public, needs to, needs to say, here I am, Pastor, I, I made that decision and I, I, I need to know what do I do next. Lord, would you draw them unto yourself that way? If there's somebody here who needs to wants to join this church, they want to be part of it. Would you draw them here this morning and let them come and say, Pastor, here I am. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm, uh, I want to follow him in believer's baptism. I want to join this church. Whatever you've laid on their heart, God, would you draw them now as we sing this song? In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand and uh, take that card, if you will, and fill it out if you can. If you haven't, we'll help you do that right now. And... Uh, will help you do all those kinds of things. So as we sing this song, would you stand? And if God spoke to you,